Yeah, so today we're going to talk about peace and quiet. Now before I start, everybody's been telling me today that I'm acting a little weird. And I don't know why, but I think they're playing some kind of elaborate prank on me to see if I'll go home because I feel weird. Okay? So if I'm acting weird, I'm, I apologize. I'm trying my hardest to be normal. But you just, you might have to bear with me. Okay? So, <laughs> so today's sermon is called Peace and Quiet. Whenever you hear the, uh, someone say, I just want some peace and quiet, usually it's coming out of like a place of frustration, right? When do you long for peace and when do you long for quiet? Well, wait, that's when everything is crazy in life because you know when, when there is peace and when there is quiet, you're not saying, can I just get some peace and quiet? I know that for me, we've been, uh, we've been renovating our house and there's times when, you know, like everything is everywhere, all, everybody, I mean, I, sorry. Has anybody ever lived in a reno? Yeah? Stuff is everywhere. Nothing's where it belongs. I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old that are just wrecking things. We were laying down glue the other day, and they just walk all over it, and then there's glue everywhere, and it's... So... <laughs> can I just get some peace and quiet? Can everybody just... Can, every, can order be brought back, right? So we're talking about peace and quiet. Um, and a more serious note, there was another time in my life years back when I really longed for peace and quiet. I was sitting in Gyro Park in Trail. Um, across the river from me was the mill, Tech Kaminko. I was working there at the time. And the reason I was at Gyro Park is because we had brought uh, a group of teenagers to Silver City Days. And if you ever have the opportunity to do that, I don't recommend it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay? One of them came home high. And I had to explain to the parent why the kid got high on our youth thing. So just don't do it. Take your own teens. <laughs> tell them leave their friends at home. And uh, so, <laughs> so, so it was crazy. We had like 30 teenagers there or something. And, and at the time in my life, uh, we're, I was working full time at Tech. So I was on a four and four schedule, which means you're working night shifts regularly. And I don't do really good on sleep, uh, without sleep. And so we're doing that. Uh, Kristen was pregnant with our, with our first kid. She was probably around three months along. We're doing uh, schooling through correspondence through Summit Pacific College. Um, I don't know. There was a lot of things going on. And we'd been, we'd been operating this way for quite some years now. And, and I was just really becoming increasingly drained, right? Like I, I just, the, the energy levels that I had and the capacity that I had for dealing with stuff was getting less and less and less. So we're at Silver City Days with all these kids, and I had some other leaders with me, and I told them, guys, like, I have to just go and, and take a break, just for a second. Like, I'm, I'm going to break down. You guys, you just, this is what's going on. There's kids everywhere. You know, make sure they kind of try to stay here. I'll be back in a half an hour. I go to Gyro Park. I'm sitting there. I'm looking across the middle, and I think, I only have about a year of living like this left in me. My life was hectic at the time. It wasn't really chaotic, it was hectic. It was gonna become chaotic pretty soon. Because what I didn't know is that um, I was, at that moment, I was about two months away from being laid off of work. And I had just bought a truck and a house. So that moment was when chaos had entered into my life, and, and things got real crazy and got real hairy. So I'm going to be jumping all over the Bible a little bit today. Um, so if you brought one, you try to like to follow along, you're, you're going to have a hard time today. You can always look behind at the screen. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That, those words there, form and void. If you go back to the original text and the language that it was written in, it would say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was, excuse my Hebrew, tohu va bohu. Okay, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, but that's what it says. And that actually stands for the earth was chaos and desolation. In the beginning, the earth was chaos and desolation. Chaos has been around a long time. 
It's been around longer than I've been around, and it's been around longer than you guys have been around. And there's a funny picture here that we get is that the, the spirit is hovering over the face of the waters. Waters was also um, symbolic for just a, a chaos, right? There's, water was known to be chaotic, without rule. It just does what it wants. And, um, and the spirit is hovering over the chaos, and it's not affected by the chaos, and it's not scared of the chaos. And, but also, interestingly enough, at this moment in time, it's not really taking any immediate action against the chaos. In the beginning, there was chaos, and there was desolation. It, at the time when my life became chaotic, I was really longing for some peace. I was longing for some order into things that I felt I had no control over. And I didn't, right? I didn't really have control over some of these things. And, uh, and I just, I wanted things to be peaceful. I wanted peace to be in my life and, and things to be all the noise of the, of the bills coming in and of all of the responsibility at the time that I felt was weighing on my shoulder just to be quiet. But what I didn't know and what I learned is that I actually had a bad view and a wrong view of what peace actually is. In my understanding, I thought peace was something that would happen to you, right? Like the stars of peace would align and then shine down upon your life. You know, like, oh, yes, it's happening. And I think a lot of us, <laughs> I think a lot of us, we, we can tend to be that way. When things go crazy, you're like, why can't we just have peace? But interestingly enough, when the Bible talks about peace, that's not what it's saying at all. When the Bible talks about peace, it's not this 70s psychedelic hippie peace. It's something completely different. There's, uh, so the word for peace in the Bible is shalom, right? You guys have heard that? It's a pretty popular word. Well, shalom is actually um, comprised of three letters. When they, the way that they write these things, it's all symbolic. Shalom is three letters long. The first letter is called mem. M-E-M, mem, and it is actually symbolic for the word um, waters and chaos and things like that. The second letter is lamed, L-A-M-E-D, lamed, and it is um, the letter that represents staff or authority, okay? Lastly, the last letter is shin, shin, okay? And that letter is either represent, is, it represents teeth uh, it's a bunch of different words. I know it doesn't really work in English. It represents teeth, uh, mouth, destruction, or, uh, or to consume. So when you actually read the word shalom, and when the Bible talks about peace, it's saying to have the teeth to destroy the authority of chaos. This is a different kind of peace. This isn't a peace that just happens to you. This is a peace that is strictly tied to authority, right? You're not, this piece doesn't wait for the stars to align. It's tied to authority. We get a great example of Jesus um, just putting this into action in Mark chapter 4, verse 39. See, I told you we'd be jumping all over. Um, this is, in, in the scene here, this is the part of the Bible where the disciples are on the boat and Jesus is having a nap because he's tired, right? And, and as he's on the boat, the waters of chaos are going back and forth in an unruly, disorganized, chaotic way. And the disciples, they're pretty convinced that they're going to die. And so they go to get Jesus because this is like their last resort, which really they should have gotten Jesus first. I feel like we do that still where you go get Jesus as the last resort, right? You're trying to put water out of the boat with your bucket. And then finally, when you're exhausted, you're like, maybe I should try Jesus so they are going to get Jesus at their last resort. And he, in the uh, verse, Mark 4, 39, it says, And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, shalom, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. This is the peace that is tied to the authority of Jesus. Right? It's not tied to some sort of external circumstance. It's not tied to just waiting for the stars to align. It has everything to do with the authority of Jesus. The disciples says they marveled at Jesus' authority. They said, who is this? 
that even the wind and the waves, which nobody can control, I'm going to trip over that. <clears throat> um, they listened to him. They listened to Jesus. Later on, we're jumping all over the place, Matthew verse 28, 18 to 20, in this scene, Jesus is, is talking to his disciples, and he, he's going to give them a commission. And Jesus came and he said to them, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, all of the authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying that he has all of the authority. There is no greater authority than Jesus. It says it's been given to him. And with that authority now, he's sending his disciples. He says, go, make more disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's saying, I've got the authority, and I am telling you with that authority to go and be light in the darkness, to go be the salt of the earth, and go and advance the kingdom of God. Go and be the peace in the chaos. Go and be the, with the authority of the peace that I'm giving you into this chaotic world. Make a difference. <clears throat> and, uh, and so in order for us to be able to really know that peace, we have to really know Jesus. And we have to really know, more than just in our heads, the authority of Jesus. Because it's easy to, to read Bible stories and to hear from other people and know in your head that, yeah, Jesus has authority. But it's a different thing altogether to experience it in your own life. Uh, Griff, Graham, Greg here, he came in <laughs> to, he came in this summer, right? This is actually a great example. I didn't ask him permission, but I know he doesn't care. This is a great example <laughs> that uh, <laughs> he came in um, to, to, to work here, to serve here, uh, with absolutely zero promise of any kind of pay, right? And, and that it was, it was a decision that got, it got you feeling chaotic at times, right? Because you had things come up and there was no pay and what am I going to do, right? And he chose to come in here and do that. And because of his faithfulness, he got to experience the authority of Jesus when at the end of everything, he got to see Jesus come through in his life, and, and bring peace that surpasses the chaos because Jesus' authority surpasses the authority of chaos. But another reality with this peace is that it, it doesn't just come. It comes with challenge. It comes with effort and it comes with understanding, right? It's available and it's there for everybody but unless you know and you can walk in the authority that Jesus has given to you, you may very well not experience this peace in your life. You get to places where you become, you become desperate. And what I hope to do is to give you guys a tool that would aid in, in, in your progress towards being able to understand and know the authority of Jesus. But it's going to take you outside your comfort zone. That's not exactly my plan this morning, but if you walk out in this, it will, because Jesus lives outside your comfort zone, right? The things that he has for you are on the other side of your comfort zone. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. Jesus is saying, Be still. And know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted on the earth. Be still and know that I am God. There's a lot of reasons out there not to have peace. There's a lot of reasons in your own life not to have peace. And there's, and, and there's a lot of reasons to not be still. I mean, I know it. I can run, especially with our rentals going on, I can run from A to B to C to D to E and never stop. From the moment that I wake up to the moment that I can fall asleep, I can be running around, I can be something, and I can do things. But the God says here to be still and know that I am God. That seems like a promise to me, right? Like if, you, if you're good at math, 
you know that the word and is always a plus sign, you know? So the byproduct of stillness is knowing God. Be still and know that I am God. But, but quiet, it's hard to come by these days. But in stillness, God is revealed. And through quiet moments, we are built up to be warriors. Because the peace of the authority that God has is carried by those who act like his children, right? Becoming a Christian adopts you into the uh, sonship and daughtership of Jesus. You become an adopted prince and princess of Jesus, right? But sometimes that doesn't mean you act like it. Sometimes that doesn't mean you walk in the fullness of what that actually means for you in your life. And probably that's because we don't take enough time to be still. And that isn't good news entirely our fault, but it's something that we have to fight for. You guys ever heard of uh, something called noise pollution? So as society increases, as more people are born, as um, all of this happened, the, the noise becomes amplified by humanity throughout the entire earth, okay? And there's been some studies that have been done. Um, well, I don't want to go there yet. Hold on. So there's a part of your brain. <laughs> sorry. There's a part of your brain that is actually um, designated to filter out all of this noise, okay? So this is, what I'm talking about with noise pollution is like, yeah, the cars driving, the planes overhead, the furnace humming, the fans going, all of these little things that can accumulatively add up. And, and this is noise that you don't notice because this part of your brain called sensory gating. It's the part that's in charge of rejecting things that you might not actually need. And if 100 ago, if this sensory gating part of your brain was a wheelbarrow, 100 ago, it was carrying a one pound load. Where these days, it's carrying a 100 pound load. So you're, you're, that sensory gating part of your brain is like you having a Honda Civic and driving it like a Ferrari, right? It's gonna get tired and worn down. And you could actually uh, get something called um, sensor, sensory gating deficiency. And they, there's been some studies done. I can give you the links to them if you're really interested. You can come see me after. But there's some studies done bete between sensory gating deficiency and chronic fatigue. There's been, even to take another step further um, from my own research that I've done, I uh, read one study that said that they did a, uh, a study in schizophrenics, and they found that uh, it was like 80 or 90 percent of the schizophrenics actually had sensory gating deficiencies. So I'm saying all of this to say that life has gotten busier over a long time, right? And, and it's, it's causing mental fatigue on everybody, but not only that, is that we, in a way, have be grown in this addiction to noise. Um, we've grown in this addiction to noise like we need it around us all the time. You know, like if you ever have a conversation with somebody and there's an awkward pause and you just, you know, or, <laughs> or if you're doing homework, you need, for me, I always like to have music or you have you know, the TV running while you're doing tasks just, so you're, just to avoid silence. We've become very accustomed to um, noise and we've actually almost become addicted to it. <laughs> it's awkward, isn't it? Is that like 20 seconds, right? You can feel it bubbling up in you. And you can feel it like, like it's uncomfortable. You don't want to be there. And, and we have this aversion to stillness. We have this aversion to what we need to do to know that he is God. Silence is quiet, but it roars. Um, there's a great... Christian thinker who had a quote I'd like to read it to you now. It says, Solitude and silence are not private and therapeutic places. Rather, they are the places of conversion, places where the old self dies and the new self is born. Silence and solitude are such forces 
because they are truly one of the only places that we are laid bare. It's complete nothingness, a nothingness that's so dreadful that everything in us wants to run to our distractions so that we um, can feel, so that we can forget about our nothingness and make ourselves believe that we're worth something. Silence and solitude are like a desert, a place we can't survive on our own. We become desperate for someone to save us and meet us there. But the wisdom of the desert, however, is that the confrontation with our own frightening nothingness forces us to surrender ourselves totally to the Lord Jesus Christ. In silence, silence is probably the greatest tool that we have. When you sit in it for a while, it drosses up your impurities, right? When I worked at tech and we wanted to clean the lead, we put it in a furnace, turn the heat up, and all the impurities comes to the top, take it off. That's what silence is in our life. In our silence, our impurities are dropped to the top. And we, we will feel our sin, and it will hurt. It's not a, a, a therapeutic process, but it, it's like a cheese grater on your soul. It hurts, and, and you feel your sin, and you've got no other choice but in that moment, when all of the things that form your identity are taken away, you give it to Jesus. You say, you know what, God, this is who I am. In those moments of silence, and I'm sure we've all had some, you realize that you might not actually like who you are. You think, am I really having these thoughts right now? Is this really in me? All of that, you can take it and you give it to Jesus. You say, this is who I am. And then you can know and understand that he takes that and he loves that. And you have this intimate moment with him, right? And you get to know him. And you get to know his authority. And you get to know his authority over chaos. And when you come out of those moments, later on, you walk different. You know him different. You're more confident, and you, can, and you can speak with his voice through your life over the chaos in your own life, over the chaos in the lives of those around you. In the silence, we become exposed and naked. Our aversion to the nakedness, awkwardness, and ugliness that we feel is exactly why we, why we need it. Without the silence, we'll actually become spiritually thin and malnourished. Be still, be quiet, be silent, and know that I am God. And I will be exalted in the city, and I will be exalted in the earth. Be still, and God will be exalted in your life. Your impurities will come up, and he'll take them, and he accepts you. There was a, 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 um, a guy named George Prochnik. He was the author of In Pursuit of Silence. And so he, he sought to find the most quiet place on earth. And this brought him to a basement in a monk temple in Iowa. I don't remember the name of the temple. It's not important. And as he was being let in, the monk turned to him, and he says, I warn you, the silence is going to take you outside of your comfort zone. The silence is so intense that it will make you uncomfortable. He said further that when people come from big cities, they're physically incapable of spending more than five minutes inside of this room. After five minutes, they will come out crying and so depleted, they just, they're so adverse to it, they ran. We have grown slowly with the same sort of addictions, our addiction to noise. And if you're here and this isn't you, that's awesome. But that's not my story. And, and we've, but we need to press into it. We see uh, in Luke chapter 5, Verses 15 and 16. Jesus was, uh, well, here, we'll read it. But now, 
Even more, the reports about him being Jesus went abroad because he was healing people and performing miracles. And great crowds gathered to him to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. We see Jesus doing and setting the example for us all throughout scripture. In the moments where people are coming to him to be cured and to be healed and to receive miracles, those are the moments he would pick to withdraw to desolate places and pray. Jesus, who perfected our faith, who is better at all of this than any of us are, chose to do that, to go and connect with God, to go and know the authority of God, to go and be built up again. And if Jesus did it, we sure need to do it. So, so why, am I, why am I saying all of this? I'm hoping to give everybody a tool so that we may know God better. Be still and know that he is God so that we can walk in what he has for us, fully knowing, not just in our heads, but knowing in our hearts and in our experiences that he has the authority. Because when you know that, and you're, you're walking into challenges, you just look at it different, right? When, when I was going through what I mentioned earlier, I didn't know that. And the chaos wasn't just around me, it bled into me. But now, having had seen God come through, I can look at chaos, and, and maybe I just haven't, you know, met a deep level enough of chaos that freaks me out, at least in the past year. But I can look at it, and I can say, I wonder what God's going to do with that, right? Because I've seen him come through a bunch of times. Griff, I was telling them, next time things get chaotic in his life, it's almost, it's got a different feel to it. God, how are you going to conquer this in my life? So, I want you to have effective tools to be lights in dark places and to be peace in the chaos and to be sharp and effective. All the noise that you, if you let it get to you, it will take away your sharpness and your effectiveness. You'll be fatigued, malnourished, spiritually thin. It's very important for us to take time to be still to know that he is God. Worship team, could I get you guys to come back up? And I'm going to finish up here pretty quick. This is the build part. A church we say bring, build, send. I want to build right now. I want you guys to go home. You got a new set of tools. You got something to build with. But building isn't comfortable. You might cut your fingers. You might bleed. And uh, you'll be sore. And you'll be hurt, but you know that you're giving it all to Jesus. Go back to Genesis 1, but this time um, all the way to verse 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the water. And now this is what happens next. It's very important. And God said, verse 3, and God said. The Spirit hovered over the chaos, not taking any immediate action until the voice of authority of God said, right? It's very possible that the Spirit is hovering over the chaos of your relationships. It's hovering over the chaos of your finance the chaos of your work, and it's hovering there, unaffected by it, not taking any immediate action, because you know what it's waiting for? It's waiting for the voice that has the authority to destroy the authority of chaos. If you are a Christ follower, that is in you. Jesus is in you. He gives you that authority. Whether you choose to wield it or not is not something that he's going to force on you. That's something you've got to choose to do by yourself. But I promise you that as soon as you do, you give permission for the Holy Spirit to stop hovering and get involved and to bring order to the chaos. It might not be right away. It might take some times, but it will happen, right? We need to be still to know God, to know his authority, 
And then we need to wield it like a weapon of peace against the chaos that has been around for longer than you and I. What a slap in the face that is to, to Satan who brings the chaos, who's been around forever. That in my short 80 years or 100 years or whatever it is here, I can wield the weapon to conquer him through Jesus. So if today you're chaotic, if today you've got chaos running rampant in your life and inside of you, we are going to be over here praying after the service. Come see us and, and, um, and let's get started, right? Find the stillness. Know God. Jesus, thank you for the love and the power and the care and everything that you give us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you aid us in our discipline of carving time to know you, to be still and to know you. And we thank you that you will show your authority to us, that you will comfort us, and that you will care for us. God, I pray for all those who are here today that are hearing your word. I pray their ears be open. It goes into your heart, into their heart, so that we may know you better. We'd be more effective for you, in Jesus' name. Amen.